Well, hello everyone. Uh, just wanted to do a sort of end of the week video, I suppose, end of uh, close to the kind of ish end of a Friday. Um, still got a bit to go, still got a few things I want to do, but um, thought I'd make one of these. Uh, I had something in mind that I wanted to share. I've just um, just decluttered my desk a little bit. It was getting pretty bad. I um, so it's I don't know for those of you maybe sharing this experience, but my desk gets to the stage where it's really good for a while and then it eventually just piles up ridiculously and, to, and I was looking for books and notebooks and I was, I was having to look under various various piles on my desk to try and find where it all was. So I've just had a decluttering, still need to wipe it down. I think it's looking a bit manky in some corners, but it feels better, feels like I've got a fresh desk again. I'll be able to, to work in a bit more of a pleasant environment. I've just realised I'm at a different angle as well. Exciting times. This is what the other half of my study looks like. But um, anyway, getting on with getting on with things. I have uh, something I want to share today. I want to share about uh, Peter in the Bible, Peter in the New Testament. Now, I remember growing up and listening to sermons and listening to talks uh, from the Bible, and you know, whether it was in youth group or in church or whatever, and uh, listen to talks about Peter. And one of the interesting things you find about Peter is that um, a lot of people would say, I really like Peter. You say, why do you like Peter? People like Peter because they felt Peter was someone they could relate to because of all the mistakes he made and the things that he said, maybe rash or impulsive or whatever. And I, I used to wonder to myself, I wonder how Peter feels about that or if he knows about that or if one day, I guess, He's with the Lord, he's in heaven, so he probably doesn't doesn't mind. He's in a perfect place. But I wonder if, you know, you sort of imagine all these people meeting him in heaven and being like, oh, thanks, Peter, thanks for making all those mistakes. Uh, that, that really helped and reminded me that God even, even has grace for me, you know, kind of thing. I wonder, I wonder how Peter would feel about that. Anyway, but one of the things we see about some of the disciples, and I think particularly with Peter, is that people feel he's very human. And they feel he very... He gets it wrong. He says some stupid stuff and and does some silly things. Uh, but in the same token, he's very bold um, and he's very, I uh, you know, he, he shares his faith with people. He he wants to follow Christ. He wants to obey Him. Uh, he wants to follow him to the end. He has his heart is often sort of in the right place and um, he does some great things and was obviously greatly used by the Lord. And um, what was what it does to just think about was God's grace in the life of Peter. And how Peter, uh, God used this amazing, uh, this sort of flawed and sinful like the rest of us, but in other ways amazing guy. So we looked at, in our Sunday sermons, we looked at Luke's gospel and how he calls Peter and Andrew to, to come, and the other fishermen to come and follow him. And John records Andrew kind of going to Peter and saying, we found the Messiah. And, and Peter's keen to follow him from the start, once he realises a bit about who he is. But along the way, we obviously see some of his um, uh, some of his his failings and some of his uh, personality comes out in the wrong way. Uh, for example, you know, read for example Matthew sixteen, where uh, Jesus says to them all, um, and I find this a fascinating passage about Peter because Peter both says something amazing and then says something very stupid very quickly after. Uh, he says, uh, "Who do people say that I am?" And you know, they said, "Ah, some say." John the Baptist, some say Elijah, others say a prophet, whatever. And he says, okay, but who do you say that I am? And uh, Peter comes out with this amazing statement of, you're the Christ, uh, the son of the living God. He, and um, Peter, you know, Christ says, you know, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. And he says to him, you know, on this rock, on you, I'll build my, build my church. And Peter emerges the leader. But um, then not long, long after that, Jesus then says, here's what the Christ has to do. Here's what the Son of God has to do. He has to go to the cross. I'm going to go up. I'm going to be delivered up. They're going to kill me. I'm going to rise again for three days. And um, Peter's like, whoa, 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 no, 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 that's, that's not what's going And it actually says that he took him aside, took Jesus aside to rebuke him for what he was saying. He says, no, 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 this, this, this isn't the right way. This isn't the right way to do it to the point where, Jesus says, um, get behind me, Satan. I mean, I often think, oh, that must have stung Peter, but he needed to hear it. Um, uh, you're hindering me, you know, he says, you have not in mind the things of God, but the things of man. Uh, Peter didn't have 
his kingdom mind on him. But he continued to follow Jesus anyway. And uh, Jesus kept trying to tell them that the way of Christ is the way of the cross. The way of the Christian life is the way of the cross and tries to kind of hammer that home to them all the way up to the cross. Uh, and this morning I was reading uh, in Matthew 26. Um, I kind of planned to took me there uh, this morning. And, and Matthew 26 is a very kind of uh, de pretty detailed description of, of Christ and him coming to the end, him coming to his death. Um, and we see that in, uh, yeah, just in, in Matthew 26 there, we begin to go to the cross. We see the plot to kill Jesus, you know, the anointing of Jesus by the woman at Bethany. Um, the Lord's Supper, they take that together. And what you have is Jesus for telling Peter's denial. Um, when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus said to them, you will all fall because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. And that's a quote from Zechariah, I believe. Let me just check. That. Yeah, Zechariah 13. He says, but after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter answered him again, brash, impulsive. Though you all fall away because, though they all fall away because of you, I will never fall away. He makes that statement. But Jesus has said to him, truly, I tell you this very night before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Peter said to him, even if I must die with you, I will not deny you. And all the disciples said the same. Sometimes they get off a little bit easy in these accounts. Well, in our review of these accounts, I should say. And then you have uh, Jesus going to pray in Gethsemane. Overcoming that and all the disciples are sleeping when they should be praying. Jesus, Judas comes with the group uh, to arrest him. Uh, and so they come out and, and, uh, and of course... That's the point where Peter strikes his ear off. The, um, what's his name? Anyway, one of the guards, he cuts, cuts his ear off. Malchus, I think his name is, yeah, as Mark records it, I believe. He strikes his ear off. And Jesus says, then put your sword back into its place. For all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Do you think that I cannot appeal to my father and he will at once send me more than 12 legions of angels? But how then should the scriptures be filled, fulfilled that it must be so? And so Jesus is arrested. He's taken before Caiaphas and the council. We read about that there. And he tells them as the, he's the son of man. And he says, you will see me coming on the clouds. And so they condemn him to death. And we read in verse 69, we're told that now Peter was outside in the courtyard and a servant girl came up to him and said, you also were with Jesus, the Galilean. But he denied it before them all, saying, I do not know what you mean. And when he went out to the entrance, another servant girl saw him. And she said to the bystanders, this man was with Jesus of Nazareth. And again, he denied it with an oath. I do not know the man. After a little while, the bystanders came up and said to Peter, certainly you too are one of them, for your accent betrays you. Then he began to invoke a curse on himself and to swear, I do not know the man. And immediately the rooster crowed. And Peter remembered the saying of Jesus, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. It's a very dark picture, uh, Peter's worst moment, his darkest hour. And uh, I think Luke's gospel, I think it actually says that in that moment, Jesus, he was close enough that you could see Jesus, Jesus looked at him just in that moment and they, they saw eye to eye. And that must have just been awful, like awful for Peter to have denied him and realised that um, he wasn't who he thought he was or, or that Jesus was right that he was going to deny him, even though he'd said he never would. So this is awful for Peter and that weekend must have just been horrible, that time, those few days. Uh, but of course we see as it were, the, uh, Peter's kind of restoration in a way. Um, and, and this is portrayed no more beautifully than in John's Gospel. When you flip over and you read John 21, Jesus appears uh, to the disciples in the first um, eight verses. This is that disciple, verse 7 says, this is John, obviously, that disciple whom Jesus loved therefore said to Peter, it is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he was stripped for work and threw himself into the sea. The other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, but, but about a hundred yards off. Jesus had shouted to them from the shore, and they realised uh, that it was him. Now, they've seen him at this point, he's appeared to the disciples already, uh, but this this is another account of it. And this passage here, later on, Jesus, um, in verse 15, says, When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Feed my lambs. 
said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to them, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. There's truly, I truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you were old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This he said to show but what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after saying this to him, he said, follow me. So the kind of the three time denial becomes a three time confession of love for the Lord Jesus. Jesus restoring him and saying, you've got work to do for me. And so he's not cast out forever. He doesn't, Jesus doesn't turn him away and say, well, you denied me that one time, therefore, you know, that's you. Um, he, he, he takes him and he, in fact, shows the, the strength of Peter's faith, really, when Jesus basically tells him he's going to die for the faith. And, and history tells us that as well. But here, he, or, yeah, it, it does tell us that. Um, but here he, um, here he confesses Jesus as Lord. And of course, Peter's story doesn't end there as do the other apostles. You know, in Acts 1, uh, you have the ascension where Jesus ascends and says, go and uh, make disciples of all nations. He tells them to go to the ends of the earth to take the gospel and they have that period where they're waiting and they're praying as I looked at before on one of these videos. And then Pentecost, of course, where the Spirit comes and people all, from all over the world are hearing uh, the gospel in their own language, even though these people are, are <laughs> don't know how to speak those those languages. And Peter boldly preaches at Pentecost until I think 3,000 are saved that day. And Peter and John and others begin to go and, pr well, the apostles begin to go and preach. They get persecuted for their faith. I mean, big time. Persecuted for the faith, for preaching the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Because there was no question as to Jesus' death at this point. Everyone knew about it. Everyone knew that Jesus had died. And part of the people that they were preaching to, some of them were complicit in that. Some of them had, um, you know, he says to them, you crucified the Lord of glory. You crucified the author of life. You killed him. And so they're aware that Jesus died. So there's no question about Jesus as a person or Jesus' death. Uh, but what they didn't want him preaching was Jesus' resurrection. Because if Jesus rose from the dead, which he did, then that changes everything. Um, and so, and they've, uh, as we're told here, that the guards were bought off that were guarding his tomb and couldn't explain where he was. And, and so um, they have to, uh, and, and so God's people are persecuted. The apostles are beaten up. And they're persecuted and told not to preach about the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. But they continue to do so anyway. So it seems, you know, new spirit-filled Peter and the apostles all all getting on fine. But this isn't the... Um, we do read of another situation later on where Peter... And, and the other thing to bear in mind before I read this is that Peter um, was the first one to really bring... Uh, the, the idea of really taking the gospel to the Gentiles, even though they've been told to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. Um, you read Acts 10 and Acts 11, and there seems to be this very specific time where Peter has this vision when he's up on a roof of all these animals descending, and, and the Lord says, take and eat. And Peter says, I've never eat, eaten anything unclean according to Jewish law. But then he, the Lord says to him, um, do not call what I've made clean unclean. So he's saying, this is clean. And, and um, he's trying to get his head around this. Interestingly, it happens three times. He sees the vision three times. That's like Peter's thing, is to see something three times. But, um, that's by the by. Uh, so, so he's trying to understand the meaning of this vision. At that point, Cornelius, who's a Gentile, um, one of his servants shows up at the door. And and, G and they, they realize an angel told him to go uh, to this man's house and you'd find Peter. And so Peter just follows the what seems to be the Spirit's work and just goes, preaches to the Gentiles. They repent. They believe in Christ and he baptizes them and then he goes to Jerusalem to say, look, we, this is what God has said. We need to be taking this more and more to the Gentiles as well. And so um, so that's a really helpful context for what I'm about to read because he more than anyone knew, um, only Paul really, as I would say, as much had this um, talk about the Gentiles. But Peter knew this. He'd had this vision from Jesus. He knew that you know there was going to be this one people of God, Jew and Gentile together um, and so on. And when Paul is, but Paul writes in Galatians. Now, Paul writes to the church in Galatia because they were at a stage where he had to rebuke them for some different things because they were, um, they'd accepted the gospel of grace, uh, Christ's 
message that the only way to be right with God was through the work of Christ, through his grace, through faith, not of works. But uh, there's some false teachers that come around, uh, sort of Judaizers in Galatia, who are saying you need Jesus plus something else, more or less. Um, and so you need to continue in works of the law. You need to, um, that's how you justify yourself before God. And obviously, we know from the New Testament that it's not about that, it's about faith. Um, but Paul describes this situation where he actually rebukes Peter. Uh, so Paul's talking about his own conversion a little bit and his own time spent with the apostles and, uh, and time there. Um, and so he's talking in uh, how he's accepted by the apostles. He says, verses 9, And when James and Cephas and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given to me, they gave the right hand of fellowship to Barnabas and me, that we should go to the Gentiles and they to, be circum to, and they to the circumcised. Only they asked us to remember the poor, the very thing I was eager to do. And then in verse 11, but when Cephas, that's Peter, came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. Why is he standing there? For before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. So he was having table fellowship with the Gentiles, no problem at all, no worries, because he knew. But when they came, he drew, when they came, uh, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. And the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him, so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas before them all, If you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? So he was, um, out of fear, he was backing away from having table fellowship with these Gentiles out of fear of what the circumcision party would think. You know, and This is Peter pillar of the early church, the one who saw these visions and who preached the gospel to the Gentiles, no problem. But when he heard the people from the circumcision party uh, were coming, uh, he was he, he, he backed away from them. He was afraid of what they would say or what they would think. Um, and so you see still that I, I'm, I'm so reluctant to criticise the guy because I mean, I'm, a, I'm, I'm nobody. I'm a, you know, Peter did amazing things, but you do see that sort of hypocrisy or that fear creeping into Peter again. And Paul challenges him on it, and, and so he has to call him out on it. And he's kind of led others astray by his example, I guess, because he's such a pillar in the church, he's such a leader. Yeah, so he pulls away uh, uh, from, from that, and he was worried about what these people would think. And so... All of that is to say uh, that Peter um, was an amazing man in, in so many ways and was so greatly used by God. Uh, but he made mistakes. He got it wrong. He sinned and um, had to be, even be rebuked even later on in his, in his ministry and in his life. But and what you see is God's constant demonstration of his grace towards Peter. And it's a good reminder for us as Christians of God's demonstration of grace towards us when we sin against him. I know I, I in the past have gone to a place where I've sinned and I've thought, oh, God, God doesn't want anything more to do with me anymore. I've, I've crossed the line as if this one sin is just so bad or this thing is, uh, God's grace has run out. Um, I'm not encouraging people to live however they want. The Bible speaks very clearly against that. But I think sometimes as Christians we can feel so guilty and burdened and heavy. Uh, but Peter's a reminder to us that um, we can be restored again and sent out again and used again. And God just doesn't dispose of us somewhere. He doesn't just kick us out. He doesn't just totally reject us and say, oh, well, you mucked up. He recognises we are sinners. He remembers we are dust and that we need him more than anything. And uh, But he offers his grace to us. He forgives us and he cleanses us and sets us on track again so if you're feeling heavy today i don't know for whatever reason uh, just take that to the lord and know that he wants to hear you pray if you have some sin to confess he loves he wants to hear you do that as well and uh, just don't ever think you can't be used again by god because of some some sin or something that's gone wrong or something you've, you think you failed to do or um, you've missed an opportunity to speak about him or something like that uh, don't let that kind of weigh down on your shoulders um, god greatly used Peter who got quite a lot wrong and, I th and he does the same with us today and I'm so thankful to God today for his grace and his mercy to us um, and because uh, we are still sinners uh, we're flawed we're sinful we need 
his help in all things and we need his grace. So hope that has uh, been helpful to you. A bit of a longer video today, actually, I think, but um, just wanted to share that with you today. And uh, I'm assuming I've sent this round with a link for Sunday and with another one or two other things as well. So hope everyone has a great weekend and we'll speak to you soon.